Hey, hey everyone, back again. Today I want to talk about what Jean Baudrillard means by the notion of symbolic exchange and how he uses that term. But before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo if you're interested in that at all. Uh, if you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way that makes them accessible so that, you know, to help you along your uh, philosophical journey here. If you want to help me out, you know, like, share, subscribe, easy enough to do, and it means a lot to me. If you want to help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal. If you found this on YouTube, you'll be able to find the audio version only in podcast form anywhere where you get podcasts and there shouldn't be any ads. Or vice versa, if you want to watch the video for this particular episode or any other videos I put up, then you can find those on YouTube if you're listening to this in podcast form now. So, don't waste any more of your time with that. Let's jump into symbolic exchange. So there are two kind of big reasons I'm doing this. Uh, I was watching the Baudrillard Derrida debate, and if there's a lot of support for this video, then I'll cover that too. Uh, so you know, drop likes, and then I'll, you know, that'll incentivize me to do that an episode on that debate as well, in which Baudrillard talks a lot about the symbolic and what the symbolic means for him. So that spurred my thinking about it and, and realizing I haven't done an episode on this uh, term yet. Additionally, there are quite a few videos circulating that get this concept so unbelievably incorrect. Now, I'm not going to name names because that would be very rude, but if you watch a video that is trying to explain that currently we live in a world of symbolic exchange or in the age of commodities or hyper-reality, somehow that demonstrates symbolic exchange, then you immediately turn off that video and burn your computer because that it's something wrong. Like that is just so wrong. And it's not even wrong at like an interpretive level. It's wrong factually. Like it is just simply wrong in terms of Baudrillard's work because all you need to do is read the very first line literally the very first line of symbolic exchange and death in which he says, and I'm paraphrasing, but it goes pretty much like this, symbolic exchange is no longer the dominant mode of exchange today. It is, it is gone. Symbolic exchange is gone. Now we're going to nuance that a little bit, but this misconception that I've seen floating around has also spurred me to do a quick little explanation about it. Now, with that being said, I'm not gonna be able to cover absolutely everything about this term. You have to go and read Symbolic Exchange and Death and the Mirror of Production, and I guess a for a critique of the political economy of the sign to really get a full grasp of this term. But I can give you a fair introduction, kind of nice foray into what it's about and how it fits within his broader project. So for him, Symbolic Exchange is diametrically opposed to everything related to political economy. It's diametrically opposed to value as well. Now, what does that mean? How, how can anything be opposed to value? Well, in the way that Baudrillard characterizes the present economic system, say, for example, we're talking about capitalism, what we have is the use of a universal equivalent in the form of capital. So we have like money in that case that stands in for other objects. So you know, in the age of just bartering, for example, certain difficulties would arise. Like if I had uh, some linen, I wouldn't necessarily know how many eggs that translated into, for example. Like, I don't know how many eggs I could get for one sheet, sheet or piece, I don't know, four by four of linen, whatever. And that raised some problems. And so the introduction of paper money or of gold or silver coins or bronze coins or whatever, made it so that suddenly we could find a universal equivalent between these two objects that would allow us to easily exchange them. That is, I wouldn't give linen for eggs, I would sell my linen in order to attain capital in the form of money, which I could then use to buy eggs. That would then, for that person, give them a certain power to go and buy someone else's products which is the product of someone else's labor. Anyway, not important. Now with the introduction of that possibility, something is lost for Baudrillard. And what he opposes that to, and he gives a few examples, but one of them is the idea of the potlatch, in which 
there was a series of gifts being given. Not gifts like you find on the internet, but gifts. Gifts that you would be able to exchange one for the other. Now this corresponds to the idea put forth by Marcel Mauss in his philosophy of the gift, in which he says that you never give anything in certain cultures that Baudrillard regrettably labels primitive cultures. When you give a gift, there is some expectation that you're going to get some gift back. But without the possibility of this universal equivalent like capital, it's, there's always going to be a negotiation as to how much you will get back in the form of a counter gift. So, for example, if I were to give someone a sheep, I don't know, a sheep, let's go with that, uh, they might return 10 pieces of linen, I don't know, for example. Now, the person who then received that linen might not experience that in the way that the person meant them to, in that they might think, oh wow, that was really generous of them to give me all that. Now I have to give them an even better gift on top of that in order to you know, make up for this counter gift that they've given me. I have to give them another counter gift. Or they might think that they've been cheated if they didn't think that the 10 pieces of linen or whatever was as valuable as the sheep in which case there, was, there would be a certain animosity that would brew and the need to deliver a counter gift that would demonstrate their prowess, saying like, you know what, I, don't, I really don't need you. Like, I have all this. I can make you subordinate by virtue of the fact that I can give you a lot. And this dovetails really well with the way that he approaches thinking about terrorism, especially in the <laughs> debate he has with Derrida, thinking about terrorism as a way to give a gift back and that language is very uh, tenuous, and, and I want to add a little asterisk. I will explain it in much more detail when I actually do an episode on that. But for Baudrillard, it's a matter of returning something that has been denied the capacity to be returned. In the case of terrorism, it's the capacity to return death into a system that has effectively purged death. Now, this might appear as though I've gone on some tangent, but at the core of symbolic exchange, or the death of symbolic exchange, is for Baudrillard the death of death, which might seem like a strange sentence, but at the core of all repression for Baudrillard and the move from symbolic exchange to political economy or to, and he calls it a few different names, the structural law of value, the law of equivalence, uh, to the code is another term that he gives it, in that move, there necessitated a kind of exorcism of death, which might seem totally uh, strange to say, like, what does death have to do with exchange? What does death have to do with currency? What does death have to do with bartering? Well, for Baudrillard, the moment that death exited the equation of life meant that life suddenly had a kind of linear sequence in which you're, you know, you're born and then you die and that's it. And that's really, the, that's the end point and that is all. Whereas previously, when death was something that could enter into a certain, uh, I guess, economy of exchange in the form of sacrifice or ritual, death had a lot of meaning, much more meaning than we ascribe it today. And so what that meant is that with the most fundamental elements of our lives, that is life and death, things that we absolutely cannot uh, avoid, what we had was not one taking over the other, in the case of life taking over death, rather there was what he calls a kind of reversibility. There was an exchange between the two of them that allowed them to kind of flow together and to mold into one another, where, you know, take the ancient pharaohs, for example, death hardly marked anything but the passageway into their continued uh, dominance over over people's lives or, or whatever narrative you want to instill in, in there. Now he takes this possibility of reversibility between these two necessary components of life to be a sign of a broader trend of symbolic exchange where bartering meant that there was going to be endless kind of gifting and counter gifting that would see no actual end. But today, in a world in which a death has been purged, suddenly we are seeing ends to exchanges. 
that resolve very neatly. And Baudrillard's very skeptical of this neatness. He really he doesn't like neatness. Neatness is something for him that that makes his skin crawl. He he one of the illusions that he gives is like a, a perfectly sanitized world in which there are no scorpions. But that's just a funny funny moment. Apparently he didn't like scorpions. And he didn't like that world because with the exorcism of death and negativity, what we saw was the establishment, what we're continuing to see is the establishment of a kind of single world order that follows a very clear set of ideals, a very clearly marked out path. And if you stray from that path, you're going to be punished. Now he uses this to think about as well, something like the gender binary where for him, he describes the case in which science intervenes to the point as to say like, okay, men are supposed to act like this and women are supposed to act like this and that's it. Now, he doesn't like that at all because if like in the case of life and death, we return to this notion of the symbolic and the possibility of symbolic exchange, suddenly this binary begins to dissipate to some extent. Now, it's important to note that for Baudrillard, it will never go away. But in the case that we are describing here, in the case of men and women, what we see is a blending of the two, kind of always bouncing across this binary. And it is by virtue of that that they are opened up into newness. They are, or this opens up, the possibility to make possibility itself possible with these perpetual transformations that aren't set in stone, that aren't a kind of given uh, kind of scientific like truth that you cannot escape from. And this extends far beyond just the gender binary, and he takes this to describe uh, the possibility for metamorphosis. Like, if we think about ancient Greek mythology, or if we take the Vedic tradition as well with uh, Hinduism, what we see are many descriptions, or Native American mythology, if I can call it mythology, uh, in the na some Native American traditions, what we see is the possibility of humans becoming animals. Now, I sh really want to stress that this shouldn't be interpreted in the same way that Deleuze and Guattari put it, put it forward, that is the idea of becoming. Rather, Baudrillard is describing the fact that we are always in this process of metamorphosis. We are always undergoing these transformations that we can't undo, and they are potentiated by our being in contact with this binary other that we have artificially constructed, yet nevertheless has this potential to continually motivate change, to motivate a, a sort of mutation on our part and on the part of the quote unquote other. Now he uses this idea as well to criticize the work of Marx, and we get this in the mirror of production, in which he describes the way that Marx doesn't present a very radical theory, at least for Baudrillard, because Marx is simply interested in man maintaining the same logic of capital and the same logic of production that purges the world of death, that purges the world of reversibility. And for Baudrillard, the real core of any political or, or real um, efficacious, efficacious, whatever, political project lies in its possibility to embrace reversibility. Because as soon as we say, oh, these people are the ones with power. That's it. Uh, there's no, no more discussion to be had. Then we open the doors for a very naive undertaking, one that is not going to understand the nuances of any given site of power and how that power is always being negotiated and transformed. Now, some people might read in this a certain nihilistic tone in Baudrillard's words, and I don't know. I never knew the guy. I don't know if that's actually how he would think. Just in my reading of him, there are quite a few moments in which he proposes very radical political alternatives to the system from vandalizing buildings and uh, taking to the streets in the form of protest. So I really don't take him to be a nihilistic thinker. Rather, he was just, in my mind, pointing to the ways in which power is always being negotiated in reality. Now, now, if you're hearing this and you're like, well, wait, I thought that symbolic exchange had gone away. I thought that the symbolic was gone. How can, how are you describing now power today being something that undergoes this kind of symbolic transformation? Well, and Baudrillard is very clever in this way. Whenever he posits a kind of theory, he's always anticipating that theory's demise because all theories, all ideas, all ideology 
cannibalizes itself, it, and in very many ways it carnivalizes itself to play on one of his book titles. That is, no system can ever be so perfect as to not eat itself and be the reason for its own demise. And he's anticipating that. He's saying, look, what we can say is that there has been this change, but it would be totally erroneous for us to say that we've just completely purged the world of this negatively constructed thing, that is how we view it today, this thing called symbolic exchange, because it still haunts us. It still remains on the margins. What we've really lost is the capacity to tap into it through myth or through poetry, even though these things still exist to some extent, or through ritual. That is, we've lost an attachment to ourselves, not as like perfectly rigid, scientifically determined, coded things. We've lost sight of ourselves as constantly mutating, constantly transforming, reversing, seducing uh, beings that are always undergoing these kind of fluctuations. And yeah, that more or less covers his, his basic or my basic approach to symbolic exchange. I hope it served as a pretty good introduction for anyone that might have been curious about it. But really, like I said, to get into it fully, you got to check out for a critique then the mirror of production, then symbolic exchange and death to get a really good grasp of the concept. And yeah, if there's anything anyone thinks that I should have added that would be really necessary for an introduction, please let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Or anything I got wrong, that's possible too. Uh, I'd love to hear about it. And yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Take care.